Amartya, thank you very much for being willing to spend this time with me here for this conversation. Um, I'll give you a little background on this conversation. As you know, uh, NWO, the Netherlands uh, Organization for Scientific Research, is initiating a large five or six year interdisciplinary research project on the quality of life. And this project will entail different types of research. On the one hand, there will be theoretical and philosophical research. There will also be uh, research that looks at measurement questions and um, more empirical issues. And then the third bit will be applied research that will be immediately relevant for policymakers. And on behalf of NWO, um, I would now like to ask you a few questions about quality of life and about this field of research and invite you to share with us your insights on this research and also on what are the urgent issues in this field. So let me just start with the general questions. It seems to us that uh, there is a general concern about the quality of life issues and that this is currently gaining a momentum, both in academic research but also in politics. Do you share this view that there is currently a momentum in thinking about quality of life issues? And if you share this view, then how could that be explained? Well, I do share that view because, um, you know, there have been a lot of occasion to think about um, questions of living standards and quality of life recently, partly driven by the fact that there have been, over the last few decades, enormous increases in capita income on average in the world, but um, the lives of many people have remained quite deprived. That's been one factor, long run. But then there's been a shorter, short run factor that the the recession that we are going through now has generated a kind of challenges in living standard mm -hmm. on the part of a substantial lot of people who are normally relatively well off, in, in, at least in comparative terms, in the global world. And even they have suffered quite a bit. And it, it's the kind of situation in which it's not surprising that you will get um, a lot of questions being asked, how do we measure living standards and so on. There is on top of that the third factor, which is connected with um, um, the fact that uh, many researchers indicated that income is only a small part of our, uh, of our sense of um, leading a good life, our ability to lead a good life. And we have been talking about it for a long time. I have been talking about it, you have been talking about it, so it's an old subject. On the other hand, the general public recognition that this is something to worry about, that's relatively recent, I think, and partly fed by research, and it's good that this is being done by the scientific organization in, 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 in Netherlands, uh, because there is a lot of scientific question to raise here. Why is it that even though income is something which we all desire more of, uh, nevertheless, it doesn't seem to have as much of an impact on our quality of life as many people expected it would. So I think there are issues of science, there are issues of psychology, there are issues of living in a society in which there are inequalities, all these questions make the question of quality of life a person's um, living standard, a person's ability to lead a good life, um, how that's affected, that, that's a become a central question. I don't think there's anything terribly surprising about that. Would we expect, would we right to expect that such a thing would have happened at this time? Yeah, so but you already made the connection between income levels, both uh, at individual and household uh, level, and also GDP, um, and um, qual the concept of quality of life. But isn't it the case that already historically there have been people who have been um, raising issues about this, um, that there is not a one-to-one -one linear relationship between income and quality of life? Are there insights we can gain from historical writers? Well, three things to say on that, Ingrid. Um, yes, historically people have questions the, the, the primacy of income in determining the kind of life we have reason to think to be good and we actually end up thinking to be good. Uh, that question has been coming up again and again over many years. It was raised very powerfully by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. 
even when he was talking about how to raise income and wealth, he also pointed out how many of our basic abilities to live well, including taking part in the life of the community, as well as um, being able to appear in public without shame, having the right kind of clothing that the community demand, depends not so much on your absolute income, may depend on your income compared with those of others who determine the quality of sartorial elegance, namely what you have to wear, and so on. So that, this is all a question. Adam Smith, about 250 years ago, raising these issues. Um, the second thing is, point to make is that um, to say that there isn't a one-to-one -one thing, that's not, I think, in with the issue. There is a one, there may well be a one-to-one -one correspondence, but the fact is that as income goes up, one-to-one, -one, the quality of life doesn't go up that much with it. So there may be a one-to-one, -one, but quality of life is not as responsive, mm -hmm. as, not, uh, as not dependent on income, mm -hmm. uh, dependent on other factors. So it is partially dependent on income. Income is one of many variables that influence quality of life. No one would deny that. But it, its impact may not be large. That's a different issue from the one-to-one -one correspondence, because you could have mathematically one-to-one -one correspondence, but you, know, you have to raise income a lot to raise quality of life by a bit, whereas a lot of other things, reducing crime in the neighborhood, looking after the environment in which you live, the kind of um, cultural confusion or cultural comfort we have, the sense of tension, social tension, and the kind of political hatred of one group by another. All these have a tremendous impact on the quality of life in a way that income could neither compensate nor can it uh, outbeat in terms of its impact. So I think that's the issue, I would say, not the, rather than the one-to-one -one lack of. Uh, there, is a, there may well be a one-to-one. -one. We don't, we don't, everything else given, if income goes up by a certain amount, maybe quality of life goes by a little bit. That could be just one-to-one -one like that. The third point to recognize is that the non-income factors that are relevant in our life have also been changing quite a bit. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm just taking one example, where income is a very bad indicator is, say, disability. If you think about this problem, traditionally, the poverty relief programs, it's certainly true of Britain, probably true of Netherlands too, has been based on looking at low income and trying to give people compensation for it. Now, if you, um, if you were to look at um, a disabled family with someone with a disability, there are two kinds of difficulties they suffer from. One is that if you have a person with disability, he or she finds it difficult to earn an income. The others also find it difficult to earn an income to some extent because they have to spend time looking after the disabled members of the family. So that reduces the income earning potential. And the income perspective captures that very well. And that has been the traditional poverty thing. On the other hand, the same thing which makes it harder for disabled people to earn an income also makes it harder to convert income into good living. You need if you are, say, crippled, you need prosthesis. Uh, if you have problem with hearing, you need hearing aid, you need attention. If you have disabilities of other kind, you need constant attention. And all these cost a lot of money. And people thought that this is so difficult to measure because you cannot actually, even with all kind of prosthesis, you won't make a disabled person fully able. But I think uh, the, uh, your friend uh, and, 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 and also my friend, or also my student, Rip, uh, Ripke Kuklis, that the work that she did in, 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 in Cambridge in her PhD was, I think, was a phenomenally good piece of work because she cut across the question. She said, OK, let's not think about how to make disabled people have the same living standard as an able-bodied person, but just what is the cost of the prosthesis to make such a person as, as able as possible, even though it remains a little below full ability. And even that turns out to be monumental. And roughly, without going into much numbers, Whipke's work based on British statistics 
was that about four-fifths of the deprivation of people with disability and families with disability is connected with converting income into good living. And about a fifth, only a fifth, connected with the lowness of income. That is, if there is, I don't, I've forgotten the exact number, if there is, say, 15% people who are poor generally in, in, in the British statistics, then there, that figure may go up to, say, 18 or 19, if you take the income earning disability. That is, if you look only families with disability, then the proportion of poor people is larger, 18 to 19. But then if you were to look at families uh, which um, uh, have uh, disability and then see what proportion of them uh, don't have enough income to meet the cost of prosthesis, mm -hmm. along with having a basic income of the poverty line, then that jumps from about 18 to about 45%. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of number which indicates how big this is. Now, these problems were not much discussed when society did nothing about disability. So in some ways, as a result of our own success, quite rightly, we worry about disability, we worry about giving people uh, you know, psychological care, for example, mental illness, which is usually neglected. Uh, we were talking earlier about um, uh, um, uh, mental problems like um, um, uh, dyslexia uh, and, and so on. Now, these things, have a feature that they have been neglected in the past. But now that we are concerned, we can see how living standard depends on a variety of these factors. So partly is the malaise of the time, but partly also it is the fact that we are more sensitive to this. We do study these. We see how people's lives are deprived by various things. And we are naturally better informed. And along with better information comes the need for more responsibility and more responsibility demands better understanding of statistics and state of play. I think that's roughly the picture where, where we stand now. It, there, there, there are good elements in it, greater sensitivity of the society to handicap, for example, being one, and to, uh, to, to deprivation generally. But there are bad elements also, because right now in the recession, a lot of people's lives are pretty badly affected. That combination we have to look at. So if we talk about concrete policies, for example, now because most governments need to, well, need, they say they need to cut their budgets because of the financial crisis. Um, often governments have uh, GDP as the yardstick, economic growth, and they want to make sure that their policies do not, do not um, undermine economic growth too much. Um, of course, if we, you could say, let's put quality of life as the central concern for government policies. Um, critics would immediately say, yes, but a big difference between GDP and some idea of the quality of life has to do with measurability. So GDP, the nice thing about it is, despite some technical issues, we have figures. Quality of life, especially if we start to think about uh, important dimensions such as social relationships, um, it becomes more difficult to measure. And this is a debate I, that always comes back. Yeah. I'm, of course, playing devil's advocate here, but I would like to hear your view about... Well, you know, I've never quite understood this argument because, uh, you know, um, if we are trying to get at something, we have to try to measure that. Rather than saying, that one we can't measure, therefore look at something else, which is very easily measurable. For example, if I said, look, let's forget about income, because even income is difficult to estimate. How do you take into account the person who cooks in the family, uh, well, does that figure in the income? Income is complicated. Let's look at length of hair. That is very easy to measure. We can see tall hair, short hair, cropped hair, bald. Now, we've got a fine degree of measurability. And to say, let's go, forget income, because that's difficult to measure also. And let's go by length of hair. Well, you're getting a fine measure, but something else, namely length of hair. <laughs> Similarly, when you're measuring income, you're getting a measure not of quality of life, but something else, namely income. So if quality of life is difficult to measure, that's what you have to face. I mean, I don't think you would have got anywhere by saying, if, sorry, I mean, this, you're sitting now in Trinity College. This is where I, I can show you the veranda in which uh, Isaac Newton first measured the speed of sound. 
But if you were to say, look, this is very complicated. I can't measure the speed of sound. I will measure something else. I will measure the speed which, which somebody could run across the veranda. Now, that would have been a good measure, but of something else. So I think the last thing that a scientist ought to do is to say, I want to measure A, but A is difficult, therefore we measure B. Because that seemed to be total, profound confusion. Now, I know that this confusion is completely clearly present, uh, present in the world. People will tell you, Let's, I am like you, I am as sympathetic as you are. I am worried about the quality of life, but we can't measure, therefore we measure something else. I can't begin to understand what the reasoning there is. That seemed to be a kind of dialogue of the deaf. The right thing to say, I don't think you heard me. I wanted to, I want to measure the quality of life because that's what you're interested. If you cannot measure it in terms of a numerical measure that is cardinal, ratio scale, if you want to be mathematically sophisticated, okay. Cardinal without ratio scale, okay. Ordering, that is a slower degree of measurement, okay, if that's all you can do. A partial ordering, which is incomplete, therefore not even a full ordering, okay. If that's all you can do, let's do that. If there is a certain amount of ambiguity, and if it's going to end up what a mathematician call a fuzzy relation, then that's it. Then if fuzzy relation is the appropriate one, then that's the right measure you're looking for. You have to suit your measurement technique to the problem that you're studying. Many, many years ago, Aristotle said uh, in one of his great books, I think it's in politics, uh, where he said to each subject, the extent of precision that you're looking must depend on the nature of the objective that you're studying. That's the question. And, and, and to say, I can't do quality of life because it is very complicated. Let me do something very simple, which can be nicely measured, is to say, OK, let's change the topic. Uh, it's almost like saying, would you like a cup of coffee? It can be very easily answered, yes or no. But <laughs> it didn't answer the first question. So let me try to, again, try to take the position of the devil's advocate. A, a sympathetic critic would say, yes, I agree, we should uh, try to measure quality of life, but I believe that the statistics we have are good proxies for quality of life, and we have them um, neatly because we have all these statistics, they're already being gathered. Um, it's going to be hugely expensive to make new me metrics of quality of life, and the existing available statistics are good proxies for quality of life. Well, that, that, that's it. What would well, be your response to such well, a question? Well, there are three things to say on this. Uh, and this is a serious question. Uh, you said a sympathetic critic. I would say an obtuse but sympathetic critic would say that. Um, first about the sympathy of that. Yes, indeed. Uh, the last thing you want to do is chuck the statistic that you have. GDP is an important statistic. It does not measure quality of life, but it measures many other things. Uh, to give a completely different example, people are so wise, and it came up also, the budget deficit issue, about the ratio of debt and so on, people are worried about. Now, when an economy is going very fast, the fact that you have a big budget deficit, you don't really worry as much as, as uh, when your economy is stagnant. Mm -hmm. And why, the reason why the deficit problem has looked very big is because GDP is not growing. When GDP is growing, you have a lot of freedom to do this, that, and other. I'm not killing GDP in any way. I think people make a huge mistake. I think the packet that is being shoved down the gullets of people right now, namely in this recession-prone economy, cut, cut, cut everything because of budget deficit, is killing the goose that's laying, could lay the eggs, namely growth. So you do need growth of GDP, have nothing against GDP, uh, in its context. And indeed, when in this so-called Stiglitz, uh, or I think, I guess the French call it Stiglitz, Fitoussi Sen Commission, uh, and where I was merely advice, I did advise a fair amount, uh, we did keep the GDP as one of the three lines of avenue. We don't want to chuck anything, and we don't like kicking things that gone away. Uh, that, 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 uh, that could be useful, but we make them go away. We don't do it. So that's the first thing. 
secondly, the, we have to recognize that if it is, if we are concerned with um, a, a living standard, GDP isn't a good proxy. Everything is moderately good proxy. I mean, um, I, I, we had, I had a student in Harvard who did a system of, if you were, instead of taxing people according to income, what about taxing people according to their height? Well, that works out quite well, because it turns out, statistically, it so happened, that income per head does depend on height, positively. So actually, you get a, some progressivity there, too. And it's not a completely bad, it's not like completely random tax. Height tax is better than uh, in taking note of difference to the income, than income tax, <laughs> sorry, than, than random tax. Income tax is even better. But just as for income tax, you shouldn't go for the proxy of height, because it's easier to do very precise, and no one can distort it. You can just measure a person's height. Uh, doesn't make it a good basis of income tax, even though there is a correlation between the two, not a terribly high one. Similarly, there is a correlation between income and living standard. Yes, indeed. But that doesn't mean that it can take the place of it. That's my second point. The third point is that it's not all that expensive, because basically measurement and statistics is about the cheapest thing that exists in the world. Compared with the big things that go and we withdraw, we make a thing, we withdraw, uh, you know, gigantic things. I will reveal my political prejudice right now, thinking and seeing, think, sitting in Britain. Britain spent hundreds of billions of dollars and have spent on the Trident. A, a nuclear deterrent without knowing who it is going to deter, actually, United States <laughs> or Russia. I don't think they're particularly concerned about China. Why does Britain, stuck with budget deficit problem, keep that on? Now, that, compared with that, statistic will be about 100,000 of that. It's almost nothing. So I would have thought that the cost argument is, is a lazy argument. So is it then, so do you have an idea then, or can you understand why then this uh, statistical effort is not made? Why do we not collect the data? Because one of the data that would need to be collected for quality of life metric would be some time budgeting data. And that of course is one of, I, I suppose, one of the more expensive because you need detailed time diaries, but it's possible. We've done it in many countries and it gives very, very interesting insights still the governments have not yet decided to um, systematically collect um, time budget. Well, I think, I think there is an intellectual laziness involved in that. Partly comes from confusion. You know, uh, I, I think the, uh, we should never underestimate uh, the power of confusion. Uh, confusion uh, can make you think something is impossible when in fact it isn't. I mean, just uh, we were talking about our common friend, Wilke Kuklis, and I like talking about it. As you know, she died very young, and just after finishing her thesis with a small child, just born, actually. And so we remember, but we remember how innovative she was. But until she started that work, I think you introduced me to her, until she started this work, it wasn't, people were not doing it because it looked very hard to do. And then she saw, as a good econometrician, that you can get quite a precise measure of that. Those hard numbers were always sitting to be done. All it required is intelligent application. Yeah. And I think the same thing is true the world over. Similarly, when you look at the big things, like when the Human Development Index was pioneered by my friend from Pakistan, Mabu um, uh, Haq, um, it isn't that people hadn't thought of that, but it was a question of going, sitting down, buckle down, and do it. And it turned out to be all it needed. What did it need? It needed a, a less than the cost of, say, uh, I don't know, uh, buying a bus. <laughs> That's all that was involved in it. Uh, so on the, on the part of the academics, it may then be an issue of having the guts, being creative, doing it. Mm -hmm. But isn't it also the case that, um, of course, most uh, academics are funded by the government, that 
there is also a tension between uh, what politicians need and what they want to spend their money on. I think, uh, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. That's the right question to look at. I think there are three barriers to it. Barrier one is that for a politician to spend of money on something which is not immediately needed and no one would notice if you didn't do it appears profligate. Because, you know, it's not like buying school meals or, or giving subsidy to some particular group. It is something which would enhance the quality of life of a nation. It's complicated, it's not immediate. The, the political demand requires imagination uh, and it requires a political vision, which very often people don't have. That's number one. Number two, from the academic point of view, it's also a bit difficult because the problems are complicated, but the complexity is not of a kind where you can resolve it with the level of precision with which you could solve, solve the four color problem or measure the speed of light or measure, for that matter, the speed of sound. Uh, it is not of that kind. So it's difficult to get your tenure based on that. It's difficult to make a huge name on, on that. It's not an alluring subject. It's quite often easier to do once you've established your reputation in other subjects, which are more easy, way of, easier to demonstrate what is it you have done, why it is an achievement. Here it's a slightly more mushy feel. So academics are not even pushing for that very much. The third is that the general level of understanding of the quality of life issues is so limited, not just because people often think of it as income, but sometimes they think of it, which I think is again a confusion, is nothing other than happiness. And happiness is again a huge trap, and then people go on saying, oh, can you measure happiness? And is happiness, what is, is happiness the right way of getting an index of success of an economy? Then you get onto a completely shunted off to a byline, as it were, if I may use a railway analogy. You're no longer on the main line. We have got ourselves into, into something different. And then some people live very comfortably on the byline, but then from time to time, other people in the main line go passing, actually wave at them, and they get a little worried about it. So, and there is a, becomes a debate. Then the byline people say, well, this is the main line. Then you get involved in a completely unnecessary debate as to whether happiness can create everything. Now, as it happened in the commission that Sarkozy appointed with Joe Stiglitz, Jean-Paul Fitoussi and myself and others, and many others. Uh, of course, some people were very keen on the happiness perspective. Uh, I think um, 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 uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, particularly uh, of Kahneman, who was quite keen on that, um, uh, and, and, and um, the um, uh, there were a number, a number of others also in the field, quite keen on the happiness perspective. But the, and I don't dismiss it, happiness is very important. Being happy is a very good thing to do. <laughs> it's not the measure of, only measure of quality of life, no, no more than economic prosperity like income is. On the other hand, it is one of them. So in, the, in our final listing, we have GDP somewhere, we do happiness somewhere. But we do also have the freedom to lead a good life and living standard, as I would claim is the right way of understanding uh, quality of life. It's also there. It, there's not, no point in quarreling with it because you may think they're on byline, but the byline people are very convinced that they're on the main line and they're getting somewhere. And then they are big support. The king of Bhutan wants a happiness index. I, I get phone calls. I've got so far about 20 phone calls saying, would I go to Bhutan and advise them on how to do index of happiness? Well, the short answer to that is no. But the long answer is to say, why is the answer no? I'm sorry. And then eventually say, sorry, can you let me off? I have to go somewhere. And I'm not going to go to Bhutan. I would love to go to Bhutan as a tourist, but I'm not going to do an index of happiness. So there is a fair amount of public, lethargy, public, lack of clarity as to what they're seeking. 
and it's in the nature of the subject. And given all that, I'm not so surprised that there's all this reluctance. But the question is, what can we do? We can break down the scientific confusion by saying that if you want to measure something, measure it rather than something else, and that the quality of life may be complicated but can be done, that is not that expensive to do, that it doesn't mean that income and happiness has no importance, but we need to do something beyond that. And that thought, and that it is politically should be important, not immediately but in the long run, but what are you? Are you a mere politician or are you going to be a statesman? And if you're a statesman, you have to look at the, at the future of the nation and of the world. And in that context, uh, I think we can win the battle. But we won't win the battle without a fight. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the example from Bhutan because they call it uh, um, gross domestic happiness. But then if you look at what exactly they are looking at, at the, the indicators, it looks much more like social indicators even going into the uh, sphere of functionings and capabilities. Yeah. So that's another problem. You talk about confusion, but um, yeah. I think if we talk about happiness, we should be talking about happiness and not have a no, sort yeah, of yeah, a yeah, right. so, What happened is that, you know, this is the byline, mainline thing, because they went on saying happiness is what we want. The king of Bhutan, who is actually a very sensitive guy, I have not met him, but my daughter, Anta, whom I think you've met, once interviewed her for a magazine. He came away very impressed, very learned guy. And, you know, a, a king who worries about the happiness of the population itself gets very high mark. So I'm very, very much in favor of that. So he said happiness, and people said, let's do an index of happiness. But then so soon they recognized that it is a byline. The lack of freedom, lack of capabilities of very important kind, which the interpersonal comparison, one person's happiness against another, doesn't properly reflect. A very disabled person may build some happiness in his life by, you know, being very bold about it. But that boldness, that uh, generated, fostered happiness, does not eliminate the deprivation. To recognize, therefore, they put in all these other things. And by that time, it's no longer an index of happiness, you're quite right. But they want to keep the name, A, because that's what they were asked to do, B, because happiness is a good name in the world. Yeah. Indeed, when the Sarkozy Commission report came up, the, 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 the distinguished Fitusi Sen Commission report came up, it was actually in fact, um, many of the papers said we have advocated an happiness index, because that's what the newspapers very easily understand. So I wonder whether we shouldn't then perhaps also push to reinstall the term human flourishing into the public discourse. Because we hear a lot about happiness, but it's used in different ways. But we, except for philosophical uh, conversations, we hardly ever talk about human flourishing. Isn't in the end quality of life about human flourishing? With the only difference that human flourishing is a is a dynamic concept and quality of life may be seen also as a time slice observation. Yes, uh, I think uh, that is right, that's one point. But the other point is that human flourishing is itself a, it's a quite, you, you as an academic find it quite easy. But it, it, it is, I mean, you know, go around in the, in, in the marketplace and talk that what you work 